that faces all Republicans and all Democrats is, can freedom in the next generation conquer, or are the communists going to be successful? That's the great issue. And if we meet our responsibilities, I think freedom will conquer. If we fail, if we fail to move ahead, if we fail to develop sufficient military and economic and social strength here in this country, then I think that uh, the tide could begin to run against us. And I don't want historians 10 years from now to say, these were the years when the tide ran out for the United States. I want them to say, these were the years when the tide came in. These were the years when the United States started to move again. The American image was tarnished. We had acknowledged that the Iron Curtain was a permanent fixture in Europe. We'd been beaten to the draw in space. We certainly had not accepted the idea of living with a communist nation so close to our shores as Cuba was. When we come back, Ted Koppel will tell us where President Kennedy took the nation, into the 60s and beyond. Forty-five, eighty-five, America and the world since World War II. Our philosophies in this age of Aquarius in the 60s and into the early 70s were reduced to buttons and bumper stickers. Make love, not war. Tune in, turn on, drop out. And an entire generation of young Americans found its identity on a New York farm one famous summer weekend near a place called Woodstock. Old familiar words took on new meaning. Grass, pot, gay, acid and old familiar privileges that we assume to be part of our American birthright evaporated overnight. Cheap gasoline? Not after the Arab oil embargo. There was a time when gas was 29 cents a gallon, but never again. But this was also the time when Neil Armstrong set his indelible footsteps on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Here on Earth, meanwhile, we were in the middle of a revolution, a sexual revolution, explained by just two words, the pill. In the 1970s, no one had to explain what the tapes meant either. The Watergate tapes meant the end of the Nixon presidency. And much of all this had grown once again out of our efforts to stem the spread of communism. God only knows how many American troops carried this icon of that era, the M-16, into the rice paddies of Vietnam. And yet the 60s had started off on such a buoyant note, the inauguration of a new president. When John F. Kennedy took the oath of office on the steps of the Capitol building back in 1961, there was a feeling that America was embarking on a fresh new course. We had a young, vibrant president and a beautiful first lady from the image point of view, it was almost as though America had its own royal family. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans He was idolized by millions of Americans, but to world leaders, John Kennedy was an inexperienced, untested commodity. Just after uh, Kennedy was elected, I happened to see Prime Minister Macmillan in London, and he wanted to know more about Kennedy, because he said, you know, I had such a good relationship with President Eisenhower. We knew each other during the war. We looked at the world more or less in the same way. We enjoyed each other's company. And now there is this young, cocky Irishman, he called him. Kennedy knew he was being tested. It shaped his rhetoric from the very first day. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, 
to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Well, it was the besetting sin of American leaders to allow their speech writers to put rhetoric far ahead of any reality whatever and in his case it was the rhetoric of freedom which meant treating uh, the communists as baddies who were going to be defeated all over the world. One anti-communist operation was inherited from the Eisenhower administration. Yuseppa Island, just a few miles from Fort Myers, Florida, had been leased lock, stock and barrel by the CIA. They wanted a private spot to interview, evaluate and train some Cuban exiles who would, only 88 days into the Kennedy administration, lead an assault against Fidel Castro in Cuba. It was the first and biggest foreign policy disaster of the Kennedy presidency. Mario Cabello was a member of the invasion squad. Then again, when the, we uh, reach uh, uh, the Bay of Pigs, we were sitting ducks. We uh, started receiving Castro's uh, air bombardments. The Castro's planes started attacking us and uh, we were eventually sunk. And my, my battalion was almost completely annihilated. The air cover promise and never deliver was the key to the invasion failure, in my view. Miles away in the serenity of Camp David, President Kennedy and former President Eisenhower confer on the repercussions of the Cuban episode. General Eisenhower promises bipartisan support for the president in this crisis. Support reiterated by Richard Nixon and other Republican leaders. Eisenhower, as was my case, never criticized what happened in the Bay of Pigs publicly. Uh, but he was vehement privately. He said, I would, he used to grit his teeth when he felt something. You know, Dick, I would never have approved a plan without air cover. Well, to my mind, it was the greatest mistake of his political career. First, because he undertook this action, and second, because he lost it. Less than two months after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, Kennedy was set to meet Nikita Khrushchev at a summit in Vienna. The Soviet leader was belligerent. Mr. Khrushchev wound up by delivering, in a very bold and uh, intimidating way, an ultimatum on Berlin. He said to Kennedy, now we're going to do this as far with the East Germans, uh, your access to Berlin will have to be worked out with the East Germans. If there is any attempt by the West to interfere with these arrangements, there will be war. Well, now, in diplomacy, you almost never use the word war. And Kennedy had to look at him straight in the eye and say, well, then, Mr. Chairman, there's going to be war. But Khrushchev, in part, I think, uh, with judgment colored by uh, his memories of the uh, debacle of, of uh, the Bay of Pigs, uh, believed Kennedy was weak. In response, Kennedy tried to show Khrushchev that he was tough. He called for beefed up troop strength in Europe, posturing for a possible confrontation with the Soviets. Soviet strategy has long been aimed, not merely at Berlin, but at dividing and neutralizing all of Europe, forcing us back on our own shores. We must meet our often stated pledge to the free peoples of West Berlin. West Berlin, located in the heart of East Germany, had become an irresistible magnet. August 12, 1961. On that day alone, the biggest flood of refugees in years. 4,000 fled from East to West Berlin. On August 13th, the border was sealed. Dr. Rainer Hildebrandt escaped to West Berlin. The folks are missed the at the beginning, it had been sealed off only with barbed wire. And then many thought, dear God, maybe we can flee through Bernauer Straße, because over the entire length of the street, the walls of the houses are the borders. So that when you are in the house, you are in the east. But if you jump from the window, you are in the west. A few days later, the bricks and mortar appeared. 